This is Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. From the corporate office to the cab of a truck, they're here to inspire and empower women in all professions. So gear down, sit back, and enjoy. Welcome. We're an award-winning show dedicated to empowering women in every profession through inspiring stories and expert insights. No topic is off limits on our show. We power women on the road to success with expert and celebrity interviews and information you need. I'm Shelley. And I'm Kathy. Imagine soaring to new heights and getting empowered to do anything you want to do. Michelle Mace Curran helps people do just that. She's a former U.S. Air Force Thunderbird pilot, author, and motivational speaker. Michelle was the only female pilot to fly with the Thunderbirds when she served and the fifth female pilot to ever fly with the squadron. She believes in empowering, inspiring, and emboldening people. Michelle walks the walk she teaches. She's a trailblazer. She was the first woman to fly as part of the 335th Fighter Squadron and worked for three years as an F-16 flight instructor in the 355th Fighter Squadron in Fort Worth, Texas. She served three years as a member of the esteemed Thunderbirds. She was a lead solo pilot in 2020 and 2021 who flew on the outer left wing of the Delta Formation of six F-16s. Her team did flyovers with the U.S. Navy Blue Angels during the COVID pandemic. Michelle has led people to new heights all her life. Her motivational speaking covers topics like flying through fear, going to war with your inner critic, and everyone has a call sign. We wanted to hear some of her incredible insights, so we invited Michelle on the show. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you today. Oh, my oh, gosh. I know. Like, I'm so excited. This is yeah. so awesome. <laughs> um I know that our listeners are, first of all, going to be just, they're enamored. They're just really curious about your Air Force career. It's been so amazing, along with what you do now. Have you always soared high? I mean, what got you into becoming an Air Force pilot? That's so cool. Yeah, I think I took a little bit of an unexpected path. Since my career kind of culminated with the Thunderbirds, a lot of people assumed that I was, you know, a kid that went to air shows growing up. But I grew up in a small town in northern Wisconsin, about 4,000 people, not an aviation family, not a military family. So I just didn't really have exposure to that world at all. I just didn't even know it was a thing. Um, but I was always a thrill-seeking, driven kid. I was a good student. I kind of just set goals and, you know, put all of my my effort in, into achieving them. And as I got to be in high school, my parents were the ones that were like, hey, you have really good grades and we don't have a college fund for you. So let's look at scholarship opportunities. And the Air Force kind of came to the top because it just sounded exciting to me it, and not necessarily because I wanted to fly at that point. But I think I just had this idea that the Air Force being focused on aviation, that aviation was just this adventurous, like exploration, pushing the limits kind of industry, whether you're in the cockpit or not. And that was appealing to me. And I also saw it as a way to travel all over the world. And I really wanted to get out of the small town I grew up on or grew up in and go do that. And it just seemed like a great way to do it. So I applied for an Air Force ROTC scholarship, got one, went off to a normal four-year college. But while I was going to my regular classes, I was also attending Air Force classes so that I could commission as an officer the same day that I graduated. And it really wasn't until I think around junior year of college when I got to visit an Air Force base with my ROTC detachment and actually see a couple of fighter jets take off in full afterburner up close from the edge of the ramp that I was like, oh, wait a minute, I need to go do that. Like It was goosebumps, jaw dropping. I'm like, holy crap, I need to go do that. That looks amazing. And that was like the moment where I'm like, okay, I'm a criminal justice major at the time, which I don't think I mentioned. Uh, so I did not plan on becoming a pilot, but that experience was so pivotal to me that I decided to throw my name in the hat, compete for a pilot slot, and then went on to be a fighter pilot for the next 12 years. That is amazing. That's what? so awesome. Oh, wow. And congrats on doing that. You're a, a trailblazer and such. you're making inroads for women. This is terrific. What do you have to do to even become a pilot. I would imagine it's pretty rigorous. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a big, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen between that moment on the side of a runway where I decide I want to try to become a fighter pilot and then actually doing it. 
And kind of that first step is competing in ROTC or at the Air Force Academy to get a pilot slot, which that's based on how you're doing academically, the leadership that they see in you as a cadet, your physical fitness, all of that. That was, it's competitive, but it wasn't, it wasn't too difficult based on the number of spots they had available. I was pretty sure I could make that happen. So that did happen. And then I went off to pilot training. Now I'm, you know, graduated with my degree. I'm commissioned as an officer and I'm going into this formal Air Force pilot training pipeline. I go into that with zero flight hours. A lot of my peers had flown growing up or, you know, in high school, had their private pilot's license. I had none of that. And I also was a criminal justice major. Like I said, that was not useful at all for for pilot training. So it was a bit of drinking from a fire hose initially. Um, You go through that and about six months into that program, they are like, hey, who here wants to try to pursue flying fighters or bomber aircraft? And quite often, there are more people in the class that want that than there are spots available. So that's where it starts to get more competitive. So I make that cut. The second half of the program, now I'm flying a jet trainer and I'm getting towards the end of pilot training. And then they have you fill out a dream sheet where you list all your preferences of aircraft that are available in the Air Force inventory. And then they take those. They look at how you've been doing your ranking within your flight, how you've been doing on flights, again, physical fitness, just overall. And they try to play this giant game of matchmaker to give people as high of a choice on their list as they can while still meeting the needs of the Air Force and the spots that are available. And to put into perspective, as far as the odds of getting a fighter, a lot of people want to be fighter pilots. Your average class when I was going through was 25 people. That's how many I had. Our class ended up having two fighter aircraft available. So the entire year, I knew that I wanted to be a pilot, but not just a pilot. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And I knew that the odds were very much not in my favor to make that happen. And so I worked my butt off to do as well as I possibly could. And I ended up getting one of those two. That's amazing. Congratulations. That is totally amazing. How many women were in your class? I'm just curious. It, just me. <laughs> I was the only Just one. you. Wow. Oh, look at you go. Yeah, oh, you, you go, girl. Oh, oh, yeah. Wow. Fabulous. So did you feel intimidated being the only woman? I think then, so... I think we'll talk about that more overall because my view on that evolved at different points in my career. At that point when I was young, I was very motivated. I I kind of had the attitude of like, watch me. Like anyone that was would raise an eyeball, eyebrow when I told them I want to be a fighter pilot, just be like, watch me. Uh, and I really didn't think about it in a negative light at all. That did change once I actually got into the fighter community and it was highlighted to me a lot. And it became something that I was hyper aware of and, you know, kind of affected my confidence. And we get into imposter syndrome and all the things that come with that as we as we talk. Mm -hmm. But at Mm -hmm. that point, I was just so, you know, I had such a specific goal and that program is designed. So you have no distractions. Like you are there for that year to learn to fly airplanes and be as good at it as possible. And so while it was stressful and we worked insane hours, I also thrived in that environment because there was no ambiguity of how you succeed. And I knew exactly what I wanted. And so I I very much at that time did not realize quite how difficult the career field I was pursuing actually was. And I was just going gangbusters to get to get it. So when did you have obviously your attitude at the time, which was perfect game on is like, I'll show you. And I totally Mm -hmm. get that. And that's almost what you have to have is that kind of tenacity and belief in yourself, because you've got obviously some people who think "Eh, women shouldn't be doing this. And I have read that women actually make excellent pilots. We have faster uh, reflexes and things like that. So I don't know if that's true, but you had such a ramp up to all of this, but you did it anyway. What carried you through this and what were some of the biggest challenges that you encountered? I think just being really goal oriented and knowing exactly what I wanted to the point where I could visualize it really carried me through. Like when I was still in ROTC and I had made that decision that I want to be a fighter pilot, even this is going to sound silly, even as specific as being in like our physical fitness training and doing our, our annual tests where we you know do push-ups, sit-ups, run a mile and a half, 
my goal was to beat a lot of the guys in the run and get the maximum number of points available so that I would have like a hundred percent on this test. And I didn't even need to get a score that high to be ranked well and well enough to get a pilot slot. But for me, I wanted to like overprove that I was capable. Mm-hmm. And so when I was running and I was, you know, like really pushing my body to to get faster and you're like on the edge where it's very uncomfortable, I would visualize flying a fighter jet. I would visualize this in front of me as I'm running on the track and I'm just like dying. I was just like, this is what I'm doing this for. This is all going to pay off with this. And I just did that through my whole training and it kept me really focused and really driven. But there were some points, especially at the beginning, when I first step into the Air Force training pipeline, there's this month long course you do um, that's initial flight screening. It's only four weeks out in Pueblo, Colorado. And the whole point of it is to kind of give you this crash course in the lowest level of aviation and these very small, slow aircraft, everything from the actual flying to how airspace works and taxi signs and talking on the radio and then the systems, right? Like the oil system and the electrical system. I did not know anything about that world. I was not a technical major. I did not know how an oil system worked. Like all of that was so new to me that there were a few weeks at the beginning of that program where I had those moments of like, oh, I have I have so much to learn. And it did feel like a lot of my peers already knew a lot about that stuff that I didn't. And so I just remember maybe my first week there, it was like almost midnight and I'm just in my little dorm room cramming information, trying to memorize these checklists, going through these flashcards, knowing I have to be up at 5 a.m. where we get stood in front of our whole flight and they just pepper you with questions. And if you get one wrong, you sit down. It's called stand up and it's so stressful, especially when you're brand new. And I definitely had moments there where I almost wanted to to just kind of start crying because you're like, I'm doing everything I can and I feel like it's not enough. Right. But I did catch up as I dove into the program, as I started to learn, I was able to make that ground up. But there were a few moments of doubt right there at the beginning. And then later on in my career, some of that came back. Um, But really, it was the start of that course and just realizing that I was starting from a little bit behind a lot of my peers that Mm -hmm. shook my confidence a little bit. Mm -hmm. And to to keep believing in yourself that that would be tough to do. It is. And, And at that point, you're so new that you don't really have a support system there yet. Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. we're all showing up. You're kind of, these are your friends and your peers or they will be your friends. But when you first show up, like any new team, there's a lot of sizing each other up, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't have anyone you can confide in yet. Like that, we end up being very close after just a month because we were all going through this really hard program together. But that beginning part when I really felt like I was burning the candle at both ends and not making as much progress as I wanted, I felt very alone because I didn't know anyone in my flight. And I was also trying to show that I deserved to be there. Again, I was the only woman in my class. Um, And so there was a little bit of extra pressure that I felt to just prove that I deserved the spot I had. I got to ask, were you, uh, did you have any problems with any harassment, like, you know, sexual innuendos and all that? A little bit. I, it doesn't stand out in my mind at that point of the training it was more a factor in a fighter squadron because how different the culture is in those units mm. versus the general training pipeline. But okay. I do think that if we could go back and be a fly on the wall with how society is now, and this is in you know 2009, 2010, mm-hmm. things that were said would probably raise a lot of eyebrows now and not oh, be sure. okay. Well, I imagine in the fighter squadron, you've got a lot more machismo yes. there. Which, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of testosterone flying around and yep. uh, you probably do get some of the comments which are inappropriate, certainly. But I mean, you weathered the storm and you were going to prove them wrong, which you did, which is excellent. And I've got to ask, what was it like? I mean, <laughs> what do you have to be able to do? To me, I can't even imagine the kind of G's you, you take as a, a, a pilot to get into one of those planes. I mean, you're flipping around doing all kinds of stuff. What exactly does that feel like? And what, how fast do you go and all of that? 
So the speed is one of the the easier things to do, I guess, because in the cockpit, even as you break the speed of sound and you you know hit the Mach, which is always something that people have like on a bucket list. They're like, I want, you know, I want to go supersonic. Um, say if they got a flight in a jet for some reason, nothing happens in the cockpit other than your instruments show you went from 0.99 Mach to 1.0, and you're like, cool, we're supersonic now, and the people will be like, that's it. It's like, yep. Um, <laughs> the only way the speed really becomes a factor is if you have some frame of reference close to your aircraft. So when I eventually flew with the Thunderbirds, now speed's a big factor because the ground is very close. So you feel like you're going very fast. But when you're mm -hmm. up at 20,000 feet, you know, like when you fly commercially, you're going very fast and you don't really feel it. It's just like, sure. cool, we're just here. G's, on the other hand, you definitely feel. Um, those are very hard on your body. And for the audience, if they're not familiar, you know, like right now we're one G, which is the force of gravity. So let's say you have a hundred pound person under one G walking around day to day, they weigh a hundred pounds. But if you put them in a fighter jet, you go fast and now you pull back on the stick. So your inertia wants to carry you forward, but now you're suddenly making an abrupt turn. Just like in a car, if you go fast and take a corner, you get like slammed to the side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same in a jet, but the axis of the aircraft is rotated. So that pressure is going towards your feet instead of laterally. And so mm. you get pushed down in the seat. Um, and most people won't ever experience more than maybe three or four times the force of gravity, three or four Gs on like some of the most extreme roller coasters, mm -hmm. if that's their thing. The F-16 can pull nine Gs. Woo. So, yeah. Woo. Which it's wow. hard to even explain to people what that feels like because now you take a hundred pound person and now they're weighing 900 pounds, you know, and most of us weigh more than a hundred pounds, right? So you take <laughs> your 200 pound fighter pilot and we're talking about almost 1500 pounds of weight. And so even under nine G's, you can't even lift your arm and you can't move your head. Like you are just pinned down and yeah, yeah sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. I'm just imagining like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so I recently posted a video on my social media of me going through the training for that, where you experienced um, G's in a centrifuge, which is just like this round room and this capsule that spins really fast in a circle to put the occupant under G forces just so they can experience it before they're at the controls of an aircraft doing it. And I was like, what? I have people watch the video. I'm like, what does this compared to for you and so many people were like this looks like when i was delivering my son or was delivering my daughter <laughs> like the amount of strain on your body um it's i mean nine all your joints are experiencing nine times your body weight so it's hard on your neck it's hard on your back it it does not feel good no i wouldn't imagine you probably can't eat before you go on a, a flight right i mean i would think that there's a risk of throwing up and everything else i mean the body doesn't like that sort of thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah so definitely if you're not used to it like when we would fly people in the back seat occasionally we would be like eat a breakfast but a light breakfast because an empty stomach's almost the worst i would say oh okay. um but really full isn't great either but when you're doing it every day you get so acclimated to it that I mean, during air shows, we regularly would eat in between briefing for the flight and heading out to the aircraft. And a lot of times we would just eat whatever was available at the air show. So that might be barbecue, it might be pizza, it might be Chick-fil-A, you know, whatever it was. And we were all fine. None of us ever threw up. Um, so you, you can get used to it. But yes, if you're not, if your body is not used to it, the stomach is an issue for most people. Oh, yeah. Well, I know it would be for me. Roller coasters and I don't get along, so I can't even imagine. But... <laughs> this is so cool. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I have one question for you. Do you want to stop worrying about the IRS? If the answer is yes, then look no further. I've been around for years. I've helped countless people across the country and my success rate speaks for itself. So now you know where to find good, honest help with your tax problems. What are you waiting for? If you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS or haven't filed in years, call me now at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com for a free consultation and get your life back. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of 
and join us on social media. Learn more at truckingmovesamerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. If you're enjoying this informative episode of Women Road Warriors, I wanted to mention Kathy and I explore all kinds of topics that will power you on the road to success. We feature a lot of expert interviews. Plus, we feature celebrities and women who've been trailblazers. Please check out our podcast at womenroadwarriors.com and click on our episodes page. We're also available wherever you listen to podcasts on all the major podcast channels like Spotify, Apple, YouTube, Amazon Music, Audible, you name it. Check us out and bookmark our podcast. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, YouTube, and other sites. And tell others about us. We want to help as many women as possible. Knowing what you want so well that you can visualize it goes a long way to accomplishing a goal. Michelle Mace Curran used that kind of focus to soar to incredible heights as a fighter pilot with the U.S. Air Force. She did this even with no background in aviation. She didn't stop even when she experienced some trials that seemed insurmountable. Her vision gave her wings. She became the first woman to fly as part of the 335th Fighter Squadron and worked for three years as an F-16 flight instructor in the 355th Fighter Squadron in Fort Worth, Texas. She served three years as a member of the Thunderbirds. She was a lead solo pilot in 2020 and 2021 who flew on the outer left wing of the Delta formation of six F-16s. Her team even did flyovers with the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. Michelle now leads all people to new heights as a motivational speaker. She covers topics like flying through fear, going to war with your inner critic, and everyone has a call sign. Michelle, when you're with the Thunderbirds and you're doing all the, the acrobatics and all of that, how does all of that work together? I've always been amazed at how the pilots know how close they are to each other and how they can just flip around and do all these tricks in the air. It's a very well-rehearsed show. So it's pretty much the same at every location, unless the weather, you know, there's clouds in the way. So we have to keep it a little bit lower Then we have a couple different options of show types that we could do. But generally, the air show is the same every time. And there's very specific timing. Um, there's radio calls that we would listen for to time off of. There's, you know, headings, airspeeds, altitudes, every maneuver has a specific parameter. So it's almost like a, a ballet. Like things are timed out, you know, exactly where everyone's going to be when. Like, you know, when I roll out from my maneuver, I look to the right and I see this jet in this exact spot every time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the rehearsal that really allows you to get there. But as far as the formations, you know, over the winter, that's our training season. Air show season doesn't start until around March and April and it ends in November. So over the winter, the team spends that time training up new pilots because um, every year half of the pilots are turning over, which a lot of people don't know. It's only a two-year assignment usually. Um, so we have a 50% turnover rate of the six pilots that you see at any given air show. So those four-ish months are spent getting that person spun up, teaching them how to fly in that environment, teaching them their maneuvers. And we have this operating manual and it has everything from references for taxi spacing to any formation that you see in the show, it will have exactly what you should be looking at on the aircraft you're flying off of. So for example, flying in that six jet formation, you know, I'm, I'm staring at that aircraft next to me and we're trying to create this uh, symmetric formation all the way across. So everyone's equally spaced and at the same angles. So we on the wing are all putting the end of that wingtip on the back of the canopy of the other aircraft. Like we're lining up those two parts, almost like a gun sight. Mm -hmm. And that puts us in the correct position. I've always been amazed by that and, and how it's planes can do that. The, the mm -hmm. amount of skill, and it is an art. And of course, if you're on the ground watching this, it's just like, wow. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It really is just, it, it's a thrill. And of course, hearing the planes go by, that's pretty cool too. We are very loud for oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, but that's, that's <laughs> half the fun. You know, you want to have your ears blown out when all these planes <laughs> go by, you know? It's great. And you became an instructor, too. So you trained a lot of pilots. Am I correct? Yeah. So the normal progression is when you're a brand new fighter pilot, you're what we call a wingman. Uh -huh. And that means anytime you go out on a mission, 
you have a more experienced pilot that's leading you. So okay. whether that's two jets or four jets or more, um, there would be someone who's a flight lead that's leading that formation that's gone through a specific training. Um, we call it an upgrade, but it's basically, you know, they lay out this academic uh, criteria, a syllabus of flights you have to go through that make sure you have all these different skills to now lead the flight. So I started as a wingman, eventually became a flight lead. And then the next move up from there and a more challenging course to go through is to become an instructor pilot. And the standards for that are a lot higher because you're not just leading people on one mission now, you are teaching brand new pilots everything, like all the tactics, all the techniques. So you are responsible for for shaping these new pilots into, you know, what they'll become. And so there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. Oh, yeah. There's also a lot of judgment required because you're going to be airborne and they're going to not know what they're doing. And you have to know how far to let them push their limit before you intervene. So you're in the plane with them. So at the very beginning, you would be in the plane with, we have a few two seat models where the instructor would ride in the back seat. Okay. Um, it's almost like driver's ed. You have the ability to override their controls and save your lives when they do it, something. Extreme. Yeah, it, it's driver's ed only scarier, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, the training's a little bit more in depth as well, though. <laughs> um, and then as they progress, though, that student is now going to be in their own jet and you're going to be in your jet and you are trying to instruct them over the radio by watching what they're doing. Meanwhile, you're still flying your portion of the mission. So there's a lot that you're responsible for as an instructor. There's a lot of judgment calls required. And there's a fine line of letting your student try things and learn and make mistakes, but not putting you or them in danger. Sure. And so figuring out where that line is, it just it just takes a lot of, of time and a lot of repetition. I bet. Do you ever deal with some hot dogs that, that you really had to rein in? <laughs> uh, most people when they're to that point, like so people that either are just don't have the aptitude to learn to fly at that level or don't have the attitude to take instruction um, and like be part of a team, they're usually weeded out in the pilot training process and they would never even end up in a fighter squadron because it is so competitive. Okay. So 99% of the time people were pretty good. Um, of course, everyone has bad flights here and there, but I don't have any students who are just horror stories. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> good for you. Cause I imagine that would make it hard to sleep at night. It's like, Oh, what am I going to do with this person? <laughs> for sure. Uh huh. I love how you've been able to parlay this into motivational speaking and inspiring other people. I mean, the topics you cover, I'm impressed with flying through fear. I mean, you've got the aviator theme in here, but you really, you had a lot of fear. If, if the, I can't believe it. even if you weren't afraid, that, that's just normal. You get up in one of those planes, there's got to be fear involved. Another topic you cover is going to war with your inner critic. We all have that, along with everyone has a call sign. Did you want to cover a little bit about what you do in your motivational speaking and what these topics are about? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll kind of give people a background as to why I went into what I'm doing now, because I get that question a lot mm -hmm. because, you know, people see fighter pilots and they're like, oh, this is like a dream career. It's it's so sexy. Like, why would you ever walk away from that? And for me, when I was with the Thunderbirds, I was getting to do some of the coolest stuff I got to do in my entire career. But by three years in, when my time on the team was coming to an end, regardless of what I was going to do next, I kind of reflected back on that. And I realized that I had gotten to do that type of flying so much at that point that I was honestly kind of burned out on it. And the cool flying wasn't really that appealing anymore. But what got me to work in the morning and what motivated me were these really incredible interactions I got to have with people where I could see them walking away inspired. And especially being... At that time, the only woman that was on the team for those whole three years um, that was flying, I would have just these incredible interactions with girls and young women where just a short conversation, especially for younger girls, it was this light bulb moment for them where they suddenly realized that someone like them could go do something like they just watched when they watched that air show. Mm -hmm. And it was like a light came on in their eyes. What they saw as possible for themselves in the world just expanded. And being able to give that gift to people was the coolest thing I've ever done. And I was going to leave that behind when I left the Thunderbirds if I went you know, to fly for the airlines or if I went onto my next military squadron. 
And I love doing it so much. And I was kind of uniquely positioned to continue to do it just with the timing of social media and the cameras we were allowed to fly with and, you know, society kind of having a big women's empowerment push and just cultural shifts. I was like, I feel like this is the right time for me to figure out a way to continue to do this. Yeah. And as I started to explore mm -hmm. options, writing and speaking became the vehicle to do that. And I don't just speak to women's groups. I speak to corporate events, you know, all over the country, um, both men and women. And what I've found is that my message is just as well received by, by guys as it is by women. And I'm very vulnerable in my speeches. I talk about, well, I kind of open with some really cool flying videos. So people are pumped up and they're just like, this is epic. Like we, I get put on a pedestal, right? They view a Thunderbird pilot as almost like this superhero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, I but, bet. But then I give them a peek behind the curtain and I talk about self-doubt and imposter syndrome and wanting to quit and being afraid and not afraid of like physical injury in the aircraft, but afraid of failing and afraid of shame and embarrassment and letting people down. And it's all stuff that we all experience. And so I come from this background that they probably can't relate to, but I meet them in a very human way. And it just, people just drop their guard. They come up to me after speeches and they're like, I feel like you wrote that for me, or that is exactly what I need to hear today. Or I'm going to go do this big thing that I've been afraid of going after because of what you just told me. And it's both men and women. And now I've been doing it for about two and a half years. And so now it's been long enough that people follow up with me. They'll send me a DM on social media and they'll be like, hey, I saw you speak last year at this event. Since then, because of that speech, I went and did X, Y, and Z, and here's how it's changed my life. And it is so cool to do that for people. Yeah, I love what you're is. doing. You're inspiring so many people, both men and women. But I think that you are really a wonderful example for women. And the topics you're talking about, we all have fear. We all have self-doubt. Inner critic, oh my goodness. My inner critic has been so loud and, and abrasive sometimes in my life. So, yeah, I mean, these are things everybody goes through. But the fact that you, you fire them up, you show people what you've been able to accomplish. I mean, they can see what's possible before you even talk about how to work through fear and everything else. Yeah, I think it's bringing it down to a human level and being approachable and being authentic and relatable. That is what really allows me to connect with the audience. And I think that's more powerful than having a cool background and some cool flying videos. But the two partnered together can really be transformative for people. And it's all based on the pinch points and the struggles that I had at various points in my career. And I feel like I'm talking... When I'm talking to my audience, I'm imagining what I needed to hear at the lowest points in my career. And those things I experienced weren't specific to being a fighter pilot. They were, you know, they're experienced by anyone who has big goals that's in a difficult career or anyone that it gets doubted by other people or anyone that worries about what others think. And I mean, let's be honest, that's all of us at different points. Oh, absolutely. So how do we fly through fear and go to war with our inner critic. I mean, those are two big topics in and of themselves. Yeah. Um, we all have it. And uh, sometimes people have a hard time doing that. And I get into very specific kind of nitty gritty things like exercises people can do to gain perspective on their negative inner voice and where it comes from and to make it kind of separate from their identity so that they can recognize it and be like, oh, wait a minute. I, I understand where this comes from and I don't have to listen to it like it's factual. Because uh, I think a lot of us, when we're in the thick of things, we have a hard time realizing that our facts or our thoughts are not always facts, right? So when you start to doubt if you're qualified for the job you're in, all of a sudden your brain is like, this is factual. You're not qualified. Even though there's no actual external evidence to, to show you that, that's just like what you're thinking. And so I help people, you know, gain that perspective, kind of flip the script and come up with ways that they can create confidence themselves, um, as well as finding their external support system and kind of dropping those barriers to really connect with people and have the vulnerability to ask for help and find, you know, their wingman, whatever that looks like for them. And then some different mental tools to help them really just rally when things get tough and they start to have that doubt. And, you know, to summarize it all, I really do think that the antidote to 
that self-doubt and that fear and that lack of confidence is action. And pushing people to take a bold step, even if it's teeny tiny, even if it's just slightly outside their comfort zone, if I can get them to do that, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I I didn't die. That wasn't the end of the world. That didn't feel that bad. I was able to do it. And now I'm like, okay, now you do it again tomorrow. And when you look back over six months or over a year and you've kind of adopted this mindset of I'm going to make these small, bold choices every day, what feels bold a year from now will be things you didn't even imagine were possible right now. Oh, sure. And it's, it just mm-hmm. creates a path for people that's that's actually doable. That kind of goes with some of the stuff you believe in, Kathy. You, What is your motto? Feel feel the fear, feel the fear. and do it in any way. Yeah, do it anyway. Any yeah. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. Do yep. it scared. Do it scared if you have to, but don't just yep. not do it. Like when I'm in a, when I was training on the dozer, um, this biggest dozer in the world, you got to think that we are uh, on the top of the Grand Canyon and I'm pushing down in, in the dark uh, to the shovel below. But I mean, I'm pushing down two levels and it's so steep. It's on an almost on a 50% incline. And this thing is so big that you you can't see where where you're going. It goes by feel, and you're you're at the edge of the cliff. And the only reason you know you're at the edge is because the whole the whole dozer tips forward, right? And you're like, oh my god, back up, back up, back up, back up. It's terrifying. It's like, oh my god, because you can't see anything, and not to mention all the the steam from the equipment, and if it's cold, and it's yeah, it's it's brutal. But when I was training, I mean, I had the two choices. Either I sit here for 10, 15 minutes and um, not do anything or choose to quit, or I'm just going to feel that fear and do it anyway. Because I mean, I I learned to train on that thing last year at at the age of 54. So it was a big thing. And I'm like, uh, there's quite, there's actually a few men on different crews who started training and said, no, I'm not doing this. And so, and here I am. And everybody expected me to fail. Yep. I'm pretty sure that happened with you, right? And and the fact that I didn't, I mean, oh my God, it it takes a year to train on these things, and so you have to go through every every uh, uh, every scenario, every every weather event, every everything possible. And at the end of my year, the trainer actually stood up and he shook my hand. He said, "I've been doing this for 25 years, and I have never seen anybody make a turnaround so so fast and learn to pick it up like you did." And he shook my hand. Wow, I was like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that because not only did that like empower you so much, but yeah. it also every time that happens, it changes the stereotype for those guys a little bit, right? And so they yep. they're like, "Oh, they you will be yeah. like the person they think back on next time they work with a woman. They'll be like, "Oh yeah, they're just as capable as the guys." Yeah. That's right. Like, yeah. And it's a great feeling, you know, just because they all expected that I was going to fail. And I'm like, ah, watch this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Watch me. Exactly. And changing those stereotypes. That, yeah. And it's but, been I mean, so long coming. Changing my own stereotype, my own mm-hmm. thought yeah. pattern in, in my head was the biggest yeah. thing. Right? Yep. Same so, for me. yep. I had to flip that switch and I'm like, nope. <laughs> Yeah. So, Michelle, is that the stereotype we have in our head? Is that part of our inner critic where we're telling ourselves what other people have told us over the years or something that we've taken to heart that we have to somehow dispel? Yeah, I think it comes from a lot of different places, depending on um, who the people are. But I've done a bunch of workshops on this. And a lot of times I'll have people share their inner critic. And I share mine. And I think mine will give people some perspective probably on their own. But especially when I transition from being in the military to what I'm doing now. It's it's a path that's not commonly taken. It's very public facing. So everyone can see everything I'm doing. You know, I'm intentionally putting a ton of content out there, advertising what I'm doing because that's how I'm doing my business. And so it gives a lot of opportunities for people to judge what I'm what I'm up to. And in my head, I realized, like especially the first year I was doing this, that when I would think about writing a social media post, or I would think about how I was going to word something in a speech. I had this filter that I was running it through about how my peers would view it. And I actually, this this inner critic had a physical form. It was a male fighter pilot. So like this older guy, not a specific one person, but kind of this combination, this avatar of what society views as your classic fighter pilot. So, you know, short hair, a little bit of graying, super experienced, 
a weapon school graduate, which is our version of Top Gun. So really good tactically. Like that's the only thing that matters. And I would worry about you know, like the fighter pilot's fighter pilot, like this ideal fighter pilot. What would they think about me talking about vulnerability or what would they think about me, you know, showing people behind the scenes of our career field? And then I realized that that person doesn't exist, <laughs> that every person that's still flying or that I flew with that has actually talked to me one on one um, in person or online since I've left has reached out to been, be like, I love what you're doing. I have a daughter and I show her your stuff. Or I'm so excited for, for what you're doing for our community. I have not gotten a single negative piece of feedback from actual real life people. That's awesome. And it made wow. me realize that my thoughts were not facts. There you go. Yeah. It, it's what we've told ourselves. And isn't that true, though? A, a lot of the things mm -hmm. we tell ourselves negatively, the negative self-talk really isn't real. Yep. Yet a lot of people have shared their own version of that. And it's been like a coach they had in high school who really demeaned them or mm -hmm. a teacher or a parent. A parent is a fairly common one. If they had a parent that was really yep. hard on them that they could never please, they were never, you know, pretty enough or smart enough for that. And these are people, you know, in their 40s and their 50s are sharing this. And so it can be there for a long time. It can come from something way back in your life. I think it's a period when someone made you feel like you weren't enough and you carry that with you. Sure. Stay tuned for more of Women Road Warriors coming up. Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I have one question for you. Do you want to stop worrying about the IRS? If the answer is yes, then look no further. I've been around for years. I've helped countless people across the country and my success rate speaks for itself. So now you know where to find good, honest help with your tax problems. What are you waiting for? If you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS or haven't filed in years, call me now at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com for a free consultation and get your life back. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at truckingmovesamerica.com. Welcome back to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. Michelle Nace Curran not only soared to the top of her dream career as an accomplished Air Force F-16 pilot, as the first woman to fly as part of the 335th Fighter Squadron and the fifth woman to become a member of the Thunderbirds, she also inspired others. She realized that giving young girls that special spark of inspiration when they saw her fly would become part of her newest flight path. Michelle is now a motivational speaker. She speaks to women's groups at corporate events and to both men and women. She talks about feeling fear, fear of failure, wanting to quit, and how her vision carried her through. She talks about things like flying with the fear. She discusses things she experienced at the lowest part of her career to elevate and encourage others to take their career to new heights. She helps them flip the script and find their wingmen when things get tough and they have self-doubt. Michelle? Are there some nuggets that you could share for women listening on how to overcome that self-critic, the self-doubt, uh, some things that maybe they could start taking some steps to fly higher like you? Yeah, I think the, the first thing I always have people do is exactly what we've just been talking about. I'm like, all right, sit down and take a piece of paper out and literally describe your negative inner voice. Describe what it sounds like, the situations that you really notice it gets loud during, and what it looks like. And the looks like part has really been powerful for people like me describing a male fighter pilot in a flight suit that's older than me, more experienced, or people, you know, realizing it's their coach, their mom, whatever. So do an exercise where you intentionally sit down and reflect on, on it to try to gain some perspective. Because now all of a sudden, when you're out in the world and you have that happen, you recognize it. And so you can, you can choose to ignore it and choose to go do the thing despite what your negative inner voice is saying. And then another great tool that I teach people is your dream team. And that is, try to summarize this as short way as possible. 
these are people that you might know, but you you might never meet in person. Like could be either one. So it could be could be Oprah, could be a former president, could be someone who's not even alive anymore. But these are people that you admire in a certain part of their lives. So the example I use to kind of make it clear is let's say I'm in the gym and I really like to lift weights and I'm not motivated to go to the gym that day. Or maybe I'm considering skipping my last set uh, for the day and just going home. On my dream team, I would have someone that's focused on fitness. So let's say it's The Rock, right? Super jacked, known for his really intense weightlifting workouts. When I'm about to not go to the gym or when I'm about to skip a set, I would be like almost like the what would Jesus do bracelets that were super popular in the early 2000s. Yeah. It would be like, what would The Rock do? He would not skip today. Like we're going to the gym. And when it comes to professional, you know, I think back to being a young fighter pilot and there being another female pilot on the base who was, you know, five, six years older than me and really experienced and always, always came across as articulate and confident, you know, and I'm nervous to get up in front of my squadron to instruct on something. I would be like, what would Taboo do in this situation? She would get up here and speak just as confidently as anyone else. And so it's finding these people for whatever parts of your lives you need it. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's if you're an artist or an athlete, someone you admire, taking that thing you admire about them and having it in your hip pocket to be like, I can channel this, what I observe this person doing in this type of situation and use it as motivation to force me to go do it right now. I love it. That makes total sense. And when you can visualize mm -hmm. a person like that, that really can propel you in the right direction. It, it's kind of like you've got somebody who's in your cheering section, if you will. That's a, a great visualization. You also have, I'm saying on your website, people can take classes. You've got the Badass Masterclass, yes. which, which covers imposter syndrome, performance anxiety, and self-doubt. Could you tell us a little bit about all of that and where people can sign up for some of this? This is great information. This is powerful. Yeah, absolutely. That it, The two things we just talked about are both in there with a bunch of other stuff. It's a virtual course. It's it's six modules. So I tell people it takes about six weeks and it's not super time committing. It's like 30, 45 minutes a week. But doing one per week gives time for people to actually implement the things that they learn. And it's really kind of formalizes the steps that I took to go from very much doubting myself and wondering if I was in the right career field to eventually getting to the point where I had the confidence to apply to the Thunderbirds and then actually go do that job. And it gives people step-by-step -step things to help build their internal confidence, to help find their support system. And I've taken about 60 people through it so far. It's newer. It just came out earlier this year. And so many people have gone and done cool stuff because of it. And it's a couple hundred dollars, so it's not extremely expensive, like bringing me in for a keynote is a little bit more expensive, but this is something that's very reachable to most people. And I share a lot about it on all my social platforms, um, Mace underscore Kern on Instagram, Michelle Mace Kern on LinkedIn, my website's macekern.com. So I'm very easy to find. Um, if Even if you Google my name, all that stuff will come up. But yeah, the Badass Masterclass has been cool because it's been a way to formalize all this stuff that I think is really useful for so many people. And present it in a way that's accessible to anyone. Well, I think everybody wants to be badass in some way. And this, I love the name of the, the class. I mean, it really expresses everything. Like, you, this is going to be a way to empower yourself. Uh, now, can this be done virtually? It's 100% virtual. Okay. And it's, it's self-paced. So that was the goal oh, great. to not have, you know, people are busy. And I might never find myself in front of most people that are listening in person. Um, and so this is a way that you know, no matter where you are, no matter how much time you have, you can chip away at it. And yeah, it's really accessible to everyone. People can maximize their awesomeness. I love it. <laughs> and people can also subscribe to your newsletter. It says, be Mace's wingman. I like that. I think we all want to be. I, I, I really love what you're doing here, Michelle. This is terrific. So, Michelle, how'd you get the nickname Mace? I understand that a lot of pilots, they have nicknames, right? Yes. Yeah, so call signs are pretty much every fighter pilot has one. And it's kind of this big... Uh, rite of passage to finally get named. And it happens after you go through all the training, you get a fighter aircraft, then you spend a year learning to fly that aircraft, and then you actually go to your first combat squadron. A few months into that, you become mission qualified, which means you've gone through like three or four months of specific flights where you're being graded. And now the squadron has deemed you qualified enough where you could 
deploy the next day if you needed to. Um, and so that's like a ton of work has gone into getting to that point. Oh, yeah. And there's not like a graduation or anything, but you're kind of brought into the fold at that point. Like you're one of us and you get a name out of that as well. And so fighter pilot call signs, they usually sound pretty cool. I mean, like, I feel like Mace is a cool sounding name. And a lot of the other ones you'll hear are like, oh, that sounds badass. But they're always based on something dumb that you did. Or occasionally they'll are a play on, off, on your last name to be something funny. But I would say the majority of the time, they are based on a mistake that you made in those first three or four months that you were at that squadron. Oh, dear. And, <laughs> yeah. So it's, I wouldn't say it's hazing because you are excited to get your call sign because it is it is this culmination of a lot of work. But everyone else in the squadron who already has a call sign goes in a room on a Friday night. There's definitely a lot of beer involved. They kick you out of the room. They close the door and they're like, all right, we're about to name Lieutenant Curran. What do you guys got for stories? And everyone that has flown with you or heard you talk on the radio or interacted with you in any way where you've done something awkward or made a mistake, which you make a ton of mistakes at the beginning, they're chiming in like, oh, she, you know, did this. She over would the aircraft or she said this, this thing on the radio that could be taken in an inappropriate way or whatever it is. And they start coming up with names that represent those. There's also a tradition that we only share our whole story in person. But don't worry, I get asked this a lot on podcasts, on interviews. So I will give you like kind of the the Cliff Notes version. When I do keynotes, I get into the very specific story of how I got mine. Mm -hmm. But it's an acronym. Basically, I went faster than I should have while I was learning to dogfight. So I broke the speed of sound when I shouldn't have which was not tactically how to fly that flight at all, which means I lost epically. And then I almost G-locked, which is going unconscious from G-forces because those those nine times the force of gravity, the nine Gs that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. that pushes the blood out of your head. Right. And it is way stronger than your heart's ability to just keep it there. So you have to strain your body, you have to flex your muscles to try to push it back up. And I almost G-locked um, where you go unconscious. So... Airborne, it was a pretty big mistake and it could have been really bad had I actually passed out, but I was right on the edge, was able to recover from it. It earned me the call sign and I will get into specifics of what the MACE actually stand for. If anyone ever sees me in person, they can ask and I'm always happy to share. Okay. Or like keynotes. Okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, I'm yeah, sure I like this. I'll save a little bit of, of you know, mystery there. <laughs> Leave the listeners curious. I like that. Absolutely. Well, people definitely need to check you out because uh, you're, you're yeah. great training and inspiration for anybody, no matter what career yeah. they're in. So it is uh, MaceCurran.com is the best way yep. to reach you. Yep. And all this, I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook as well. And you can just search, even if you search Michelle Curran, I'll come up. This has been just a blast, Michelle. I really... <sighs> I admire you. I admire your tenacity. And you're a wonderful example for women. There are going to be a lot of girls who are going to say, you know, I want to be like Michelle. This is cool. Absolutely. My God. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it is truly an honor. It's a responsibility, but more than that, it's an honor to just have found myself in a position where I have the opportunity to do that. Um, and it, I really love what I'm doing now because of that. You're doing a wonderful service for everyone. This is terrific. Thank you for being on our show. Absolutely. Thank Thanks you, for thank having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Sure was <laughs> great to meet both of you. Great to meet you, too. I want to play the song from Top Gun now. <laughs> right? The Danger the Zone. Yeah. The Danger yeah. Zone. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> this is terrific. We hope you've enjoyed this latest episode. And if you want to hear more episodes of Women Road Warriors or learn more about our show, be sure to check out womenroadwarriors.com. And please follow us on social media. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. On our website, we also have a selection of podcasts just for women. There are a series of podcasts from different podcasters. So if you're in the mood for women's podcasts, just click the Power Network tab on womenroadwarriors.com. You'll have a variety of shows to listen to anytime you want to. Podcasts made for women. Women Road Warriors is on all the major podcast channels like Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Audible, YouTube, and others. So check us out and please follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. 
You've been listening to Women Road Warriors with Shelley Johnson and Kathy Takaro. If you want to be a guest on the show or have a topic or feedback, email us at sjohnson at womenroadwarriors.com. Thank you.